stay on it. Welcome, everybody. It's so fabulous to see all of you, albeit virtually. Uh, thank you so much for your amazing contribution and efforts towards uh, producing this performance. So we are here to talk about the graduating classes project to perform in quarantine in, sh in shelter in place, Julius Eastman's Stay On It. The piece and the project, the project grew out of a student initiative. And maybe I'll just uh, ask Troy if you could talk just a little bit about that. I had felt like it would be wrong to not send off the class of 2020 in music because we are, we are a conservatory. So I didn't, I was having, I was racking my brain about how to do it. And then I saw orchestras around the world put together just videos of pieces. And then, so I think I said it first to Dean Quillen. I, and I said, well, why don't we do that? Or why don't the professors do that? At one point, I just threw it out there. I said, how about Julius Eastman's Stay On It? Partly because I thought, you know, it, it's, it's not the kind of other projects you're seeing uh, in these mashups. I thought it might be a little bit unique and different. Uh, and I also felt like the poem in a certain way resonated with the experience we're having. You know, when, when we were first talking about this project to begin with, I remember one, one of the questions that we had is, you know, because, you know, some other schools have put together, you know, a lot more conventional sort of rep, but we wanted to find something that was, that was collective and that was much more open and that students could participate in, whether they're, you know, classical musicians or jazz musicians or vocalists or instrumentalists or, you know, tomorrow, you know, we truly wanted something that was, open to all, participatory, collective. So, so this just, it just, you know, was a perfect fit. It seemed going through and through. And um, I guess I'd echo what Tim says. I mean, the, the performance, when you hear it, is there is an, a, this, this energy that bursts. I mean, it really bursts out of the speakers. It, it, it's infectious. I, 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 I was just giving our little four-year-old a bath and had it sort of playing in the background. And so she's going around singing, da, 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 you know, and it, it's just absolutely uh, contagious in the best way. And it, 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 it feels like this life affirming, joyful, um, totally optimistic testament. And um, I hope you like it. I think you will. Hey, my name is Troy Stevenson. I go by he, him, his, and I am a recent graduate of the class of 2020. Hi, my name is Colton Potter. Uh, I'm a rising senior uh, at Oberlin, and uh, I'm from Orlando, Florida. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm also a rising senior at Oberlin. Um, I use she, her, hers, um, and I'm from Indianapolis. Hi, I'm Tim Weiss. I am the conductor of Oberlin's Contemporary Music Ensemble and we're so glad to be here with all of you. So it is now August 11th and uh, we put together this project, Stay On It by Julius Eastman back in May. Uh, Troy Stevenson here was sort of the initiator of this project, wanting us to do something to celebrate the graduating class. And I'm so glad, Troy, that we embarked on this project into the dark because none of us knew how this was gonna work. <laughs> so what are we now, three, four, five months after that? Um, how do we feel about the project? Um, I mean, looking back on it, it, well, first of all, just say it seems like it was ages ago um but looking back on it it was a really cool experience and it was i think my first introduction to recording with a click track and putting something together online so it was um a really neat thing to do at the beginning of this pandemic um 
because just working on the individual part and then seeing it all come together as a whole was um, a really uh, honestly inspiring experience because I was like, oh, you know what? This works. This is really cool. We can still make music with each other. Um, and I think that was pretty comforting. And um, now looking back, you know, I've, I've done a few more of these ensemble virtual recording projects. And I think that uh, being able to perform Julius Eastman Stay On It was a really cool project because of the piece. It's minimalist and, you know, when you're recording your individual parts, you have absolutely no idea what it's going to sound like as a whole. Um, and so being able to see the end product come from just playing like, you know, two bits of thematic material in your bedroom um, was really neat. Whereas I think other pieces we could have chosen would have been almost less, less meaningful because it's less of a you know, community building thing where you're really building this piece together. It's very unique to every individual and every um, aspect of the group. So I think that was a, a really neat experience. Yeah. Colton, Troy, anything to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I feel extremely grateful to have been a part of um, this project. It was also my first like ensemble recording project with a click track and I had no idea what to expect going into it. Um, and I think what really sticks out to me is the total night and day difference between um, the emotions I had preparing and like performing the piece versus when uh, I saw the project come together later. When I was preparing, it was a lot to keep track of uh, in my mind and listening to the click track and playing and, you know, um, in, in kind of 10 different places at once. And so it was a very, um, I don't know, it was, it was, I was kind of anxious because all these things were happening and it was my first time doing it. And then um, watching it later, I was just totally overcome with emotion um, because of the time we're in and how amazing it felt to then see that we were actually all making music together um, and creating something that was really Oberlin, I think, um, and, and, and felt like a community. It was really special to me. So I'm really glad that, that we did it. As far as myself, um, going into this, virtual performances, I was like, okay, cool. Temporary thing, well, it'll end by the, by the time the summer's over, right? Five, six months later, virtual performances are becoming the norm across the country in orchestras. It's how, it's how orchestras are staying relevant in this time. So to see that that's become a standard is very interesting. And for me, recording on a click track was the first, and I was like, okay, how bad can this be? The first time through, eh, it was, eh. I, was, I was like, okay, this is gonna be what it's gonna be. It won't be perfect, but here we go. And I just went for it. It was odd at first, but then you kind of got into it. But then if you would make a slight mistake, you'd be like, oh, gotta go back and fix that. But then I'd have to run myself, wait, I can't. I just have to keep going. So I have to literally stay on it, unintended. But literally the second time around, it was much better. But it was just very interesting, a new type of skill that I had to develop as a musician. Yeah. Katie, you, you mentioned that it wasn't like Bolero. And uh, I just, just I want to state the obvious, because sometimes we, the obvious we just forget about. You know, if you're going to put together a mashup of something like Bolero, as an example, or a piece that you all know, then... You have your part, you set the metronome, you play it, 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 it kind of works. You, you have an expectation that, of what the final product will be. And you know what your role is uh, in the process of assembling that final full project. But with this, it's worth saying that we really didn't know because the score is not finished. The score is intentionally 
um, left very open so that the group has to literally create their own pathway through it. Um, because you're just given a little cell. Well, how are you going to use that cell? How many times are you going to do that cell? Who's going to play the cell? Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the addendum cells, the, the, the subsidiary cells that, where you can embellish it. Who's going to do that? How many times should we do that? When's it going to end? So we, ha we ha actually sort of collectively had to map a way through this. And we literally had no idea what the finished product would be. And that's where the anxiety was. Um, and I, I have to agree with you. I, I share in that anxiety. It was stressful. Um, and it was, there was so much joy and emotion, like you said, Colton, when we saw the final result. It wasn't perfect, right? It was our first time doing something virtual. We didn't really know how it was going to work. But it was, it was wonderful in all of its messiness. And it was uh, both joyful and emotional to see the final result. And I do, I do feel like, in a way, we stayed on it. And it, it provided something for us as a community, which was important. Troy, you also mentioned something that, something that in a way that it felt relevant. And I just have to say that for me, it would have been less relevant if we had done something that we have all played before in person, something that's old, something that's canonical. But somehow it felt more relevant that it was something unknown to us, something new to us. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's the world I live in, but our, our experience, both in the current times, but even in the broader times, uh, are, is somehow a representation of our, of our common human experience. And I feel like we have to make sure that we're keeping it new in order that it be relevant. And that means thinking about the works that are created around us in our own time. And so I felt that this commitment to this composer, to this piece, at this moment, felt relevant. What were the obstacles? So I, I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit from the students what your experience was like dealing with this click track with my voice telling you what to do. It was actually very frustrating at first to, um, well, when I started trying to actually make my final takes, I had to try so many times and I didn't really expect that. Um, just, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So you guys said it's okay if there's some moments where you kind of make a mistake and we can edit that out. But I was like, no, I want a perfect take. So I was like really trying to um, get it down. But um, I think just without having anybody around to respond to, there were certain things that felt like um, just really difficult. Um, all the transition areas just always kind of caught me off guard. So it took many tries before I felt like I could anticipate some of the changes and do it effectively. I, for one, wasn't ready the first time I recorded because especially this section at F where it's just a lot of fermatas and you're just waiting for the two, three. Um, I would always jump the gun or I would mess up going, going some, into it somewhere. And of course you, you did say it's fine if we have a, little, a few little flubs, but a part of me was just like, is it okay to send this? Is it okay? And then, but I just went for it. But after, for me, the first, the biggest challenge was just feeling everything and, when, and where it was. I think it also took uh, a great deal of pre preparation before even recording, at least for me. Um, I had to look over the whole roadmap like a million times and listen to the click track before even trying to play along. So it was just kind of like a little time consuming, but a really cool and constructive way to use this time where I didn't really want to practice my own stuff. So it was ended up kind of being contributed towards a really cool common goal, I thought. I think one of the harder things was trying to imagine the ensemble around you, um, which, you know, is what we would be responding 
Well, let me just share a little bit about uh, what happened when you started to upload all of your recordings. Uh, in the first okay. 24 hours, I was completely freaked out. Paul sent me, Paul put them all into Sequoia and sent me the rough mix, just what happened when he just dumped them in. And I was like, <laughs> what are we going to do now? Because I imagine, well, first of all, we all know that you cannot have ensembles, chamber music, successfully in quarantine. There's not yet a technology that allows people to really communicate while in a virtual environment. And we all know this to be true, but it became so glaringly true and real when I listened to that first rough take because I thought, they can't hear each other. <laughs> so you're playing in a vacuum. So just issues of um, playing the same length or the same shape or the same tempo or the same pitch or um, it, just, it just became this quagmire. I think if we were to do this again, and I'm not suggesting that, uh, it would be fun to um, have one, two, or three people record it with the click track and then send out the click track with a couple of people playing so that you can follow along basic patterns. But, you know, of course, I don't think any of us have uh, lived in quarantine for two months, eight, six weeks. Uh, so we learn from the experience. We know what to do better next time. I think what we have in the end is something that's a little bit uh, DIY, homemade, a little bit rough around the edges, but it has this unbridled musical enthusiasm and energy that I think is kind of infectious. Yeah, I think on the video end, I think a DIY experience um, but it also, I think what's fun about it too is it's, it's, it's raw. It is, um, it's very much what's, what's going on here, which is trying to make something together while you're so far apart. For me personally, an obstacle that I quickly realized, I was like, okay, so I'll do my recording. I'll get, I'll get it in somehow. But then I realized, we're, we're a group of string players, different string, different, not just a few instruments, like multiple different string players, multiple different wind instruments, piano and vocalist. And then another thing, to, and I realized, okay, we, you told us to all tune to 440 or 441, whichever number it was. However, some certain, certain tuners, certain pianos, certain devices or, or certain apps or whatever, might obscure what what um what your ideal 440 is and then when i realized that i was like oh this is this this there's no way we can there's no way we can make an exact intonation across the board for this and so i was like oh this this is going to be interesting to hear and then on top of that i was like okay wait audio <laughs> because as i've come to realize more and more Getting getting a recording equipment or having the proper recording equipment to re to do these virtual performances gets really expensive. Like you can easily you can easily drop minimum two hundred dollars on some what on what a mic that some people would call bare minimum. So I realized that this as well. So I mean I knew that I, I already knew I was like this isn't going to be perfect. We we don't have the time or the money to get all these recording every, send everyone recording equipment. So let's just go for it. And I went for it. But something I didn't realize is that I had to, I, my room was quiet. But what I, what I also had, didn't realize, I think Tim sent me an email regarding some noise in the background of my first recording. And although it didn't occur to me as I was doing it, there are other noises that might not be voices that your mic will pick up. And you have to factor for that or just simply change the device you're using or in the stand you use, um, there are multiple different factors that I had to, that I had to consider that I didn't before in terms of recording, because prior to this I was in a concert hall, fully fully decked out recording equipment, um, largely soundproof, um, and it counts canceled out any extra noise. 
my phone or my friend's laptop didn't have such settings. So you had to really factor for that, as in you had to make your own little recording studio. It was, a, it was different. It was very different for me. Yeah, I would definitely second that. Um, I mean, just not, not even like playing the music uh, um, was, the, I don't think that was the most difficult part. I think, I think honestly, just preparing to do so, to record and getting that done. And, you know, there are just so many things that you don't realize goes in behind the scenes of creating this type of video. And like, you know, I, I remember a few days before the recordings are, were due, I was like texting Colton and I was like, oh, like, what should I do about this? Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, like, oh, in, in this section, what are you doing? Um, you know, because I, I kind of, I like to micromanage and think through all my options before I actually do something. Um, so it was just a lot of, like, personal planning and, like, you know, as Troy said, figuring out some logistics of intonation and creating your own recording studio was uh, difficult because you don't I mean when you're think, uh, playing in a concert hall with 50 other players or however many other players you're not really thinking oh you know how live does this room sound like what's around me or am I gonna like how how are my surroundings really gonna affect the sound and like what the microphone is picking up, um, you know, what are people seeing in my background? Like, um, so it was just a lot of planning. And then also with this specific piece of music, um, it was really important to really know the score. Otherwise, I mean, it wouldn't have been together at all if people just kind of played and, and so it was, a lot of planning and preparation um, that was not just learning the notes and, and, you know, working with an ensemble. So it was a really interesting experience. Definitely. I, I, would, I would definitely echo what Troy and Katie have said. And um, yeah, like, like they have said, the, the biggest obstacle for me was um, it, because we're so used to um, performing with an ensemble in person live, when you're hearing other people's choices, especially with a piece like this, where there are choices to make, or at least more choices to make, uh, than something in the standard repertoire. So, um, but, so I think a lot of the um, performing, um, decisions one makes, whether it's improvisation or just, um, you know, length of notes and, and basic things like that, it's, it's in, we're so used to just, um, it, it, it's just informed on what's going on around us and what we're hearing. And um, so we're, we're used to that. We don't think about a lot of that stuff anymore. And so when you, when the rug is completely pulled out from under you by doing something recorded, when you're not hearing all those things, suddenly that those decisions have to come from somewhere else. And that, that became preparation and understanding the score. And I mean, to some extent, you, you can't know what other people are doing, but the, the, the more informed you are about the score, then the more informed you can be about those kinds of improvisational choices and otherwise, so. Absolutely. The, and it was glaring how true that is because you take it for granted. So let, let, I'm gonna to try to make an analogy. You know, again, if we talk about doing something from the canon that you all have played before, a Beethoven symphony, it, you know, for the most part, what the correct or appropriate note length is or what, how much accent on this particular spot or what the phrasing is for this. And so if you did it in quarantine, if you did it virtually and you weren't together, you would probably be much, much closer to the target because you all played that repertory and you, and you know what, what the standard practice is. But here, 
it was new for all of us. So, and we hadn't actually discussed some of those things because we hadn't really been aware of the obvious. Exactly how long should I play that? Is there an accent here? What do we do with this? And so what, what I realized right away, <laughs> heard all these parts together was that all of these things would be fixed without having to talk about them in a rehearsal because what we do as musicians is we constantly take information and we adjust what we're doing on this most subtle minutia of, of a level. Um, you play this longer, you play that louder, you play this faster because you're adjusting all the time. And here's an analogy for the person who's just watching this piece and uh, doesn't do this in their life. If, if you're gonna give me a ride um, over to my grandmother's house, uh, you drive, I sit in the front seat, and I'm gonna tell you, okay, turn left here, and you turn left. And then I'm gonna say, okay, on the third light, take a right. Um, okay, now, this works fine, right? It's not hard to do. Okay, now I'm gonna give you directions. I'm not gonna be in the car with you. I'm gonna give you directions. Is it a little harder? It's a little bit harder. Okay, now, but you, but you drive, and you're, you're driving your car, and you can see, and, and, and you can kind of read the directions as you go, and it works okay. But now I'm gonna put a blindfold on you. <laughs> you're gonna drive your car, and I'm gonna sit next to you because uh, you can't read the directions now. You get a blindfold on but I'm gonna tell you when to turn. Okay, so you're driving along. Continue driving. Okay, in a few seconds, you're gonna turn right. Ready? Turn right. <laughs> okay, you did okay, but you, you took out that tree and you hit that mailbox. So again, I keep going. So this is, this is what it's like playing virtually because you, when you're driving, you you told you told to turn right and you turned right but and you but as you're doing it you recognize that there's uh, a dog that just came out of the road so you're gonna not hit the dog and then you notice there's a pothole and right so you're, you're taking into account all the little tiny things but you don't you're not actually conscious of it because you've driven so many times that you take it for granted. It's the same thing with this. If you play this if you play this with live people where there's sweat and smells then you can adjust to all those things because that's what we do. But when you take them away, it's like driving blindfolded. And those are things that can't be represented with language either. Like the length of a note doesn't get, you know, English doesn't get nearly close enough. To Nor does music nuance. It's right. all just these weird little benchmarks, staccato to nudo. But there's a big difference between the interpretation of those. Yeah. But I also want to add here, because we just, you just heard this in the, in, in the interview from before. There's a DIY quality to it that is reflective of what we have all gone through in the pandemic. Right? We're making this up as we go. And there's something beautiful about that. Right? I don't think someone is going to 50 years from now, go back and hear our recording of Julius Eastman stay on it and go, gosh, that was such a great recording. They need to know the context and the DIY quality of it is really beautiful. This musical life that we have is changed and I do really feel that you all, your great musical gifts and talent and skill, but your ability to be creative and to eternally make lemonade from lemons positions you to make a really big impact uh, in your own musical communities when this, as we come out of this. And I'm just so excited to watch what you come up with. So it's so fun to watch this video in hindsight uh, and to have a little bit of a nostalgic experience remembering what that was like. I'm really looking forward for our semester to start in just a few weeks. Um, it's sort of a partial return to normal. It's not quite fully normal yet. 
Um, what do you think the future of ensembles will be like, assuming that the pandemic will come to a close in the not too distant future? Will we return me, to normal? For me, I would say that there's going to be, well, in, in terms of ensembles such as chamber groups and, and like perform and like orchestras and contemporary groups and whatnot. I think as far as programming goes, there's going to be a very interesting, well, there's, go there's going to be more outlooks on reaching audiences online because what, if anything, the pandemic has taught a lot of people is like, wow, I can get a lot of, I can get my, my music out to a lot of people online. And then some people are doing this already, but there's, there's money to be made doing that, doing virtual concerts. It's like, sure, get a nice enough camera, get a nice enough recording equipment, and you have a, and you have a concert. And, it, and, play, and play at the same caliber of, of a live performance, you have a concert because that per, that one say some that one one that one soloist in Houston that wants to put together a concert, but these people in Germany or these people in um, London or these people in South Korea want to see it. Obviously, they can't go live, but now if the, if, the, if the technology becomes more access accessible, it's as easy as just clicking like buying a fifteen dollar ticket and going. So I think there's going to be more regular, like, of course, once we go back to live, live's going to become the staple. But I think that it's going to be a more customary thing to the online performances. And from there, recording equipment's only going to be improved. It's going to be, it's going to be more readily available. And so on and so forth. And this opportunity, has, the time that people have had on their hands in the pandemic has given them a lot of opportunity to access pieces that aren't in the so-called canon. And so that is going to be another very interesting thing to see. So it's something that I hope to see happen because this, the piece that we did stay on it, something that I never, I mean, sure some things like this have been done, but I never, never in my life did I think I would do it as a graduate, as a group, as I graduate. So it was interesting to see it happen. So I'm curious to see how further, not just Oberlin, but the music world itself can diversify their repertoire, not just in genre, but also not, not just in um, the music we play, but the accessibility to it as well. Because you, you already talked about it, Tim. It was kind of too hard to get this music, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. I think that um, definitely, I mean, even just personally, I've explored, been able to explore a whole range of music that I wouldn't have, uh, you know, learned while attending a conservatory because I, I feel like in, I mean, at Oberlin, definitely um, we have so much more access to being able to perform a lot of contemporary music and music that you know, isn't necessarily in um, the usual canons. Um, but I think that there will be a much more expansive use of repertoire that is not normally performed. And I think that that's a really special thing that has come out of the pandemic, that we've realized that there is this huge cache of music that is just a, a really incredible um, that we can't do have the ability of performing, um, you know, on our own or with an ensemble, whether it be virtual or in person. Um, and one of the other big impacts that I think has come out of this is that um, I really think that after the pandemic, people will, you know, be more inclined to support the arts and the music business and just because being in quarantine quarantine I, I think that everyone has had to rely on the arts and being able to see performances live or you know even just listening to a playlist 
on Spotify. It's been a source of comfort and a source of, um, you know, engagement and, and doing something while you are forced to be isolated from people and having social interactions. And I think that the arts have been an extremely important source of comfort and, um, you know, relief during this time. And I think that that will be reflected in how ensembles are going to be led in the future. I, I think that definitely there will hopefully be more um, community outreach and accessibility. Yeah, I, I don't have a ton to add. I think those are really great points, Katie and Troy. And I, I think that this whole um, explosion of technological solutions uh, and implementations of art is, of course, it's bittersweet because, um, yeah, I think access is like the key word here, with the ability to collaborate and share art with people across the world. Um, it's not a new thing, but this has jump-started um, our ability to do that. And it's funny that access is, access to, to music, especially live stream, is so tightly um, tied to accessibility of internet in general across the world. As, we, as we're able to bring higher, higher speed and bandwidth um, internet access to people um, who aren't as lucky as us, uh, we'll be able to also increase access to music in general. But at the same time, um, I think that this time has, has forced us into a unique perspective on the fact that, that music, as we make it together, is not just about um, sound waves. It's also about uh, being together with people. And sometimes that is a thing that should be done in person. And um, we should maybe recognize the importance of making art with people when you're near them and with them. And um, yeah, doing that with people you love, uh, which, which sometimes should not be through a computer. So it's a mixed bag and it's exciting and scary at the same time. I'm right with you. I think that the pandemic has jump-started um, an amazing offering of really great music online. But, you know, I spend so much of my day on Zoom looking at my computer screen that I actually miss going to concerts. And, and here, and, and I'm going to just kind of try to spell, uh, give you a little bit of a justification for that. When I go to a museum, I go with the express purpose of looking at art or experiencing art. I don't believe that public art or graffiti or art that I see outside is of any lesser value or has any lesser ability to communicate than art I see in the museum. But the difference is that when I go to the museum, I am intentionally going there to look at art and have that experience. And I am 100% ready to give my full attention to that experience. Um, so in music, when I watch a concert online at home after having spent my day online, I am more easily distracted by other things going on around me in my home. So what I miss is the sort of frame that the concert provides to allow myself to have that attention and focus on listening to music. I'm not saying that art outside in the streets or music online is of any lesser value. What I'm saying is that my ability to experience it is heightened when I give it the intentional act of going to the concert and having the lights dim, and having the musicians come out, 
I'm ready for that experience. I kind of miss that. But, but Colton, you're right. I also miss the social aspect of it. I miss sitting next to other people. I miss talking to them about if they liked that piece or what they thought of that performance or wasn't that oboist fantastic. And I think that we will return to that, I hope. I also think that, sadly, some cultural institutions might not make it through this. And the silver lining here is that we are all finding new repertories that didn't formally come across our ears because they didn't fit nicely into the establishment that we had created. So I, I'm looking forward to the new things discovered. The idea of doing this again would be very interesting and exploring different kinds of music by different types different different composers um because it'd be, I, I just think it'd be interesting to see and to re to really um dive into the things that aren't in the canon because this piece although not in the although not in the canon in term but in terms of contemporary music doing something like this isn't completely isn't completely out of this world Doing it virtually is, <laughs> yeah. and that was yeah. fun. But <clears throat> as I've said, as I've said over the summer, multiple times on multiple occasions, I I think it'd be I think what I'm interested in seeing is how the music world reacts and changes. Let's hope it does. Let's hope it does, and let's hope it's not a change that's temporary in response to the current situation. And let's hope it's a, a sustained, long-term, ongoing commitment to the change that is necessary. Come on now, baby. Stay on it. Change this thread on which we move from invisible to hardly tangible. With you moving and grooving on it, Making me feel fine as wine. I don't have to find the meaning. Because you will have filled in his most invisible and intangible majesty's place. But only if you stay on it. Although his majesty does stay with it, he can't stay on it. Does that move you? Ties that move and break, disappear, and return again are not ties to stay on it. They are some tiny bonds. These bonds cause screens like the edge of night. With ivory snow liquid to appear. This is why, baby cakes, I'm ringing you up. In order to relay this song message. So that you can get the feeling, oh sweet boy. Because without the moving and the grooving, the caring and the sharing, the reeling and the feeling. I mean, really.
Stay on. Chin the thread on 
which we move from invisible to hardly tangible. With you moving and grooving on it, making me feel fine as wine, I don't have to find the meaning. Because you will have filled in his most invisible and intangible majesty's place. But only if you stay on it. Dig. Although his majesty does stay with it, he can't stay on it. Does that move you? Ties that move and break, disappear and return again, are not ties that stay on. They are some tiny bonds. These bonds cause screens like the edge of night with ivory snow liquid to appear. This is why, baby cakes, I'm bringing you up in order to relay this song message so that you can get the feeling. Oh, sweet boy. Because without them moving, and grooving. The caring and the sharing. 